Chasing Ghosts on Scooters in Bars, the podcast that blends the modern scooter lifestyle with a twist of the paranormal over a cool cocktail. My name is Mark Elgin. I am an avid scooter rider and have a persistent and nagging interest in ghosts and the paranormal. Though I'm no expert or professional, and I certainly respect those that are. So welcome to Season 1, Episode 3 of Chasing Ghosts on Scooters in Bars. If you've been following the podcast so far, thank you. If not, a quick update is in order. We're a group of friends on Vespa scooters, well, mostly Vespa scooters. They're on a multi-day run in Northern California, but we're from Washington State, in search of dive bars, classic pubs, or haunted taverns in the Sierra Nevada mountain area up there in Gold Rush country and down in the Sacramento Delta. This is an annual event, though we go to different areas uh, each year, and we call it a pub scoop, and this is our 10th one. This will probably be the last installment of this particular pub scoop format, after which we'll be featuring just one bar at a time with its history and hauntings. Of course, after next year's pub scoop, we'll be on another multi-episode series covering that particular mess. Well, we'll have more of a mess to, to explain and describe <laughs> by then. Well, hey, Mark. Welcome to welcome back to the podcast. Well, it's good to be back. And we've also got Lonnie the Lizard Murray. Thank you for having me. Hey, Mark. Uh, have we gotten any feedback on our first two episodes at all? I'm, I'm dying to know. <laughs> well, let me just uh, share with you a couple of things. Oh, we have? Oh, we have. <laughs> we have. In quotes here, absolutely charming and delightful. Can't wait for the next one. This is from an artistic director in an ad agency in Hawaii. Wow. Um, Season one, episode one of the podcast was quite entertaining and surprisingly well done. This is from a banker in Alaska. What do you think? I think that's outstanding. (laughs) We have at least two fans. That's right. Here's another. I really like it. You and the other Mark have a great on-air chemistry. Dig it. This is from a musician in Seattle. Well, he must be a musician. He doesn't get it. I'm the other Mark. <laughs> That's right. And these are just a few of our initial reviews of Chasing Ghosts on Scooters in Bars. But Mark, there is no mention of spooky or scary, unnerving, or even a simple chilling. You know why? Why? Because back to my original point on episode one, I'm not sure ghosts are even out there. You keep searching for these things. I have yet to get real concrete evidence. Well, this is what this episode's about, Mark. Um, It's going to have a more ghostly approach. And I've had enough of the charming and delightful stuff. We want, we're going for the big scare. Meat and potatoes. Uh, We do appreciate the feedback, ratings, and reviews. Uh, It does help us get better and to bring a stronger ghost, bar, or scooter story right into your headphones. (laughs) <laughs> Which reminds me, if you work in or own a haunted bar, tavern, or restaurant, please share your story with us. Just go to chasingghost.net and submit it, or record it and send it attached to an email to me at markh at chasingghost.net. And if you're in the Washington State area, we may even come to you, armed with a microphone, paranormal gear, a credit card, and even our scooters. <laughs> it, uh, so we need to hear from the people. We do. We, okay. we need to hear who's out there experiencing things so we can come join them and, and get these stories out there to everybody. And uh, dry days would be better. Rain, rain's not so good. Yeah, cool is okay, but, yeah. but uh, the wet, wet and rainy is not good. And snow sucks. So back to our adventure. Our cast of writers include myself, my co-podcaster here, Mark Shelley Schilbert. Uh, our third co-podcaster co-po- here, <laughs> Lonnie the Lizard Murray. And <clears throat> later, as promised on the first episode, Lonnie will be explaining that particular moniker. We have Uncle Bob Helgen. He's my way older brother. We have Mike, or as you like to call him, Ike Franich. And then Keith and Greg, uh, Greg, born in the USA, wobbled, and they're brothers who are eight years apart, but the younger is really the older. Wait, why do you call him born in the USA? Well, I think it's a reference to your comments earlier about how he, uh, on his his Honda Ronda, that he calls it, uh, with his flag and duct tape, looks and like he could have done some time in Dine. Brown leather jacket, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Um, Keith, uh, who moved to Sacramento a few years ago, is from Washington. He had orchestrated the ride and, and is our host on this particular trip. And did a wonderful job. You know, uh, Mark, one of the reviews brought up the fact that we never caught up with Lonnie the Lizard and how he got that nickname. And uh, I thought we'd better get started talking about that particular uh, story. Well, it's well worth a good story. I mean, he's he's got a real reason it came about, and um, it's been a good story. Well, he's used it a lot. In fact, he's here with us. Well, you know, <clears throat> I have used it to some degree, and, and part of me wants to keep some, some of it a mystery. Um, you know, the lizard um, has some tricks, <laughs> <laughs> but... Is it, a, is it chameleon-like? <laughs> I bet you'd like to know. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, your friend Keith called it a, a gecko. <laughs> Where is Keith? Keith Bryant is the one that called it a gecko, I believe. Oh, that's right. But uh, we did record an audio clip of you explaining where you got that particular uh, nickname. So let's, uh, let's put that in there now. Well, I'm back with Lonnie a.k.a. The Lizard, and I uh, thought we'd take a moment and just say, and ask, Lonnie, where does that nickname come from? I, you have more than one nickname, but where does this one come from? <laughs> Why do they call you The Lizard? Well, you know, um, I think it went all the way back to the last time we were in Sacramento, and uh, we made a stop. I believe it was a gas station, and I had taken off my shirt, and I was laying on a, on a rock. It was a very large rock. <laughs> 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 and um, and um, I think it was you, Mark Elgin, that eventually put the lizard tag on me, and and it came back came back out this last uh, trip back to Sacramento, and um, somehow we started We're sitting in a bar. Somebody called you the lizard, right? And the bartender said, "Well, why do they call you the lizard, Lonnie?" And the first thing that came to my mind was, I think you know. <laughs> and that kind of escalated to uh, bar after bar. <laughs> and uh, I'll probably uh, have a lizard on my tombstone in three years when I die. <laughs> <laughs> if you make it. Your wife killed you. <laughs> Where did you get that name? <laughs> if you make it that long. But it turned out to be a really uh, fun part of the ride. It was a lot of fun. All right, Lizard. Uh, with that, we'll uh, we'll get back to the podcast. Well, Lonnie, you got a lot of mileage out of that. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just um, I'm just a team player, and I'm just trying to help entertain the group and uh, have a little fun on the road. And it turned out that the Lizard was was a pretty fun way. Or well, you're all right. The lizards yeah. are cold blooded, Lonnie. So go. <laughs> you, you warmed you warmed your back that day. You, you warmed ladies' hearts since then. So you, it's it's come over. It was you were laid out on that rock, li literally like a lizard. You it was know, hilarious. I still remember that warm rock, and um, I bet you we go back there again someday. Well, it's a good thing you weren't laying on your stomach. That would look a little odd. <laughs> You'd be known as Ass Man, not the lizard. Well, the mystery of the lizard. Uh, is it's been now solved. been solved and uh, we'll get on to the ride and we're going to be doing that now. So our ride picks up after our evening and great sleep with a wonderful healthy breakfast with Andy and Nancy at Serene Lake. Uh, we headed through Sugar Bowl and then down Donner Pass where we got a great photo op but we passed on anything to eat. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, because in Donner Pass, there right, was, right. okay. And then uh, we went into Truckee in the morning. We parked, we walked, and we waited. But every bar in Truckee was closed, and there was no way to coerce them to open. It was a little uppity, that town, but very charming aesthetically. Well, it, it kind of shows you our approach when we couldn't wait 15 minutes. We decided to bail after they wouldn't let us in. Was that really all the longer it was? Wait, and so we bailed somewhere else looking for a drink. I think it was because we also felt, well, why couldn't they just open 15 minutes earlier? Well, we felt very strongly well, about that. Who wouldn't want to open their bar to uh, seven drunks on scooters uh, with the shakes? Magnificent seven. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, excitingly, we've been joined by Greg and Keith. We talked about them earlier. Born in the USA, Greg and Keith. Greg's younger, older brother. Keith's a little bit mad because on episode two, as he says, he was left on the cutting room floor. 
So, unable to experience the interior charms of Truckee, and it was, by the way, Bar of America that we couldn't bribe to open, uh, we headed up Highway 89 through Squaw Valley and then on to Lake Tahoe, where, again, to our slight frustration, the bar still had not opened. Do you remember that? Yeah, well, thankfully we had Keith with us, and he thought of another idea. Well, he took us out of town. <clears throat> this is day three. We had a tremulous evening the night before. We needed a healing beverage, and apparently Lake Tahoe, or Tahoe City, does not share our predilection for an early imbibement. What kind of words are we using here? I'm not sure. I'm going to have to go to a book I don't know. Here. I guess the beautiful people there in Tahoe are into health and wellness, and then afternoon cocktails. They've got an ass backwards. But fortunately, just out of town, we found Jake's at the lake for a morning catch-up. Wonderful screwdrivers. They were good. And if you remember, I was having a little trouble that morning. You couldn't uh, kickstart yourself to I, save your life. I was having issues. Until a screwdriver found you. Well, and then we moved on to uh, the fat cat. That really got me going. What was it about the fat cat that you liked? It was the uh, bartender oh. uh, that was one of the very best on the trip who had... Terrific assets. Uh, yeah, she did. She could she pour. Did. And um, she entertained us. We stayed there for two rounds. We were perked. A guy bought us a round. He was uh, a medic, retired medical inventor. that Some uh, sort of contraption to save lives, yeah. He did. As he was poisoning his liver <laughs> right. and ours. But that that's where our day started to get behind. It did. In fact, we were behind that whole day. We we went from there to the bridge tender. And if you remember that, you parked your scooter up against a wall because <laughs> there was absolutely no parking. That's you right. couldn't even put it on a kickstand. You let you put it up like a 10-speed. That's where an $1,100 scooter comes in very handy. <laughs> <laughs> the grand dink. <laughs> Uh, I'd also like to point out, the bridge center is not a very friendly place. It wasn't friendly. They did not like us. Um, I wonder why. <laughs> well, it was still early in the day. We were only in our third bar. And you remember our disclaimer, we only have one drink or less per hour. So we weren't Unless terrible. we're at Fat Cat. Where we did have two. But it was <laughs> worth <three>. it. <laughs> Wish I could remember her name. I went online. I went to their Yelp page. I tried to find out well, her name. Well, it's not her name, really, that you remember anyway. So what the hell? Yeah. Um, then we went from the bridge tender. We drove around a little bit, went by the Swiss Park where you got a photo. Yeah. And then ended up at Chambers Landing. Do you, do you remember that place? Mm -hmm. It was out on a dock at the, at the end of a pier. And it's now, what I see online, is permanently closed. What? It's where the propellers on the t-shirts were? No. I don't remember. That's where we met a gal from Washington. Gay Harbor or wherever she was from. Oh, in fact, she was with Margulis' daughter, Ed Curtis. I yes. think that's correct. Yes. Yeah. That's closed now, huh? It is, so maybe it's for sale. Well, another one. <laughs> <For> <laughs> or maybe we made our mark. <laughs> <laughs> Kill the bar. Well, and so it was on to South Lake and Brothers Bar and Grill for some much needed lunch. Um, we, we've talked about a lot, and now we're just to lunch. And it was needed. It was. This was a pretty friendly place in the RV park style. There were trees through it, uh, other bikers hanging around, and a dude with the spools removed from his ears that were hanging a little bit. Yeah, he had a dangling participle. Didn't look like, <laughs> didn't look healthy. <laughs> um, everybody's scooters were running well. We'd, got, we'd gotten into no bad gas, and confidence was high to head back through the mountains on Highway 50 to meet Ike's, or Mike, Ike, Ike's daughter in Placerville. And just uh, an aside here, I married her and her fiancé, Will, shortly after this trip, because I am ordained, and, and you know, if anybody wants a scooter-style wedding, I'm... Hey, let's stop with the shameless plugs here. Yeah, yeah, let's go back to the scooter yeah. trip. Hey, <laughs> Their, their wedding was, uh, I think I did a good job, except that I lost about 10 pounds of sweat. Uh, it was really warm, and I was really That's funny. I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, funny. <laughs> um, we visited their spirited dogs at their house. If you remember Bogey and Manza jumping over the couch. And, yeah, I think I shit myself a little bit when yeah. I heard the one barking. <laughs> Once lover. again, you are a dog lover. Um, we did invade them, and they poured us a nice cold beer and a glass of wine and they live in this great town Placerville if you remember our last trip Keith we went to Liar's Bench yes we did but not on this trip not on this trip so why why did we not go to Liar's Bench 
Well, we had another six hours of riding, and it was probably four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that trip over the mountains was a was a long one. Your your attitude needs to step it up a little bit here. You're a little grouchy. So we did opt because it was on the way for the recently reopened famous Poor Red's Barbecue and had a golden Cadillac. Mm-mm-mm. This is the world famous drink that made that bar the number one consumer in Galliano in the world. And Galliano is a banana liqueur, is it not, Keith? I know that it's Italian in origin. I don't know if it's banana or not. I believe it is. In the Golden Cadillac. What's their other drink, though? There's another one they make, the brown cow? The brown cow. So we had both, I believe. If I, if I may interject at this point, I would liken the Golden Cadillac to a big boy's Orange Julius. They are delicious. That's a good way to put it, Greg. Nice touch. Same consistency, very frothy. Very, very, they're delicious. Greg, did they serve, um, uh, did they have an Orange Julius in Saigon? <laughs> you know, Remember the name? <laughs> <laughs> tell you what, the Tet Offensive is still burning in my mind. Gentlemen, you don't know. I, uh, I don't want to go there right now. It's a dark place. <laughs> as a point of interest, I do believe that in one night, if you remember the Galliano bottles, they don't use the short ones, they use the tall ones. They went through, I believe, 179 bottles of Galliano in one night at Poor Reds. Good Lord, that's a lot of Galliano! <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a super unique place. Uh, it's popular with two levels to the bar. It's a stair-step design, a cool old building, great neon and, and painted combination sign. I think it was probably haunted, but we had to get on the road. We were late uh, behind. It was super busy, so we probably well, couldn't have gotten a story there anyway. But my face was a little puffy from a bee sting. You I suffered um, the same affliction that Greg had earlier. So, so that my, was a little bit of karma for making fun of him, wasn't apparently it? Apparently so, but uh, his ear was pretty grotesque. But I, Uncle Bobby saved me and got some meds from somebody in the Some bar. Benadryl. Benadryl, and uh, my face cooled down and depuffed. Almost. And I was ready to go again. Yeah. <laughs> you know. My nose is still a bit large, but that's about it. Boy, so you had the face issue on this trip last year. You had your wire, your jaw wired shut. You were stuffing pizza between your teeth. Shouldn't we be heading down Highway 90, 49 or something? <laughs> so, so Port Reds was on Highway 99 on our way to Jackson, um, where we would be waylaid a little later. Um, and, and as we cruised along there, we ended up at the Dry Town Club and Barbecue, where we uh, learned about the bartender's daughter's problem with a spirit attachment. Oh, that's right. But she didn't really want to get into specifics. She was a little guarded, and it spooked her to talk about it. So we... Um, but you helped her. I did. God bless you. But I'm not going to I'm not going to put that on, on there because she was it was very very uncomfortable about it. So, we saddled up after wetting our whistle at the dry town and went straight to the town of Jackson, a place we'd visited a few years earlier and it really intrigued us. The historic downtown areas where we parked and started at the Fargo Club. There's been a lot of arguments about the name of that place. Before heading downstairs of the National Hotel, to Stanley's Steakhouse Bar. Any thoughts about those two places, guys? We stayed for a while. I know that. At both bars, we bounced back and forth a little bit. But you're looking for a story, and this provided a story for you. Several good interviews. The uh, There are, and we're going to get into that. I want to talk a little bit. Now, Lonnie, how'd you do at the Fargo? Well, you know... The lizard wandered over to the Fargo and met a bartender who was pretty friendly. And um, what was his name? Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Steak. No, the Fargo was a good stop, and and uh, that whole that whole little town was. Yeah, we've been there twice, and we've had two really good good uh, stops. Good sure. visits there. Yeah, there is just something kind of electric and appealing attractive about that town um if you like fish dips right <laughs> Are you gay fish? <laughs> i'm just saying jackson california is an interesting spiritual and haunted place and home of the argonaut and kennedy mines with the first deposits discovered in the 1850s and the site of the worst <clears throat> mining disaster in california the entrance to the mine is just about a mile from the National Hotel, and we understand that shafts run under the town itself. 
hear from Greg is a little bit about the disaster we found online and up in the cloud. It was August 27, 1922, and 47 miners, mostly immigrants from Italy, Spain, and Serbia, were trapped in a fire 4,650 feet below ground. Other miners who had been near the surface poured water down the shaft in an attempt to put out the flames. By dawn, townspeople and other miners arrived to help, but it took two and a half days for the fire to be extinguished. Rescuers began reopening tunnels from the Kennedy Mine, which had been closed since an earlier fire in 1919. It was slow going, but hopes remained high until September 18th, when a canary inserted beyond a bulkhead by an oxygen tank equipped worker died. Still, it was three weeks to reach the level at which the miners were trapped. None survived, and evidence indicated that they had all died within hours of the fires breaking out. One of the bodies was not recovered until a year later. Most likely, water flushed down the shaft carried his body further into the mine, but the, in the intervening time, newspapers speculated that he had fled the mine to start a new life. It was determined that the mine had violated safety regulations, but the owners escaped punishment as the United States Bureau of Mines had little enforcement power at that time. The cause of the fire was never determined and put down to incendiarism, a broad term meaning either arson or defective wiring. Wow. It sounds like this horrible tragedy also may have souls with unfinished business, adding to the activity found in the town. So this is these, these ghosts that you were talking about earlier. We're getting to them now. We're getting to them. And while we were at Stanley's, that's the downstairs bar at the National Hotel, we spoke with Trevor, the owner of Temple Recording Studio, located right there over the mines in historic downtown Jackson. So I'm with Trevor. He, he owns the Temple Studios in Jackson, California, a very uh, historic town. And he his studio is haunted. I wouldn't say haunted, it's very spiritual. We'll say that. Well, let, let's share a couple of stories. Uh, they just like to let you know that they're there sometimes. Um, late night after I've shut down all the equipment, you know, we'll get a we'll get a light turned on real quick that I know I shut off and I can it actually will wake me up. Um, we'll get some knocks that actually I keep my dogs there at night too with me and they'll wake up from it and um, I know when the guy comes up in the morning, when he opens his shop up, he gets there around 5 a.m. So we're talking, you know, middle of the night stuff. A few knocks here and there. Um, nothing too, you know, I'll definitely tell them. I like to, you know, leave me alone because I'll hear a, a door open and close real quick. A tension type of a, spirit. A heaviness. Just, you can feel it. Yeah. Sure, sure. And uh, I'm not afraid of ghosts at all. Not at all. I've never had a negative experience where I was, you know, scared, but uh, I've definitely said something out loud in the middle of the night, like, hey, leave me alone, you know, because uh, it happened multiple times. And I have witnesses, too, that have stayed there with me late night, and, you know, uh, a girlfriend might have stayed, and, she, what, you know, she's like, what's that? And I just say, you know, this is an old building, and there's probably, we're probably not quite alone, you know. So, but this whole town is haunted, right? It burned down. Well, we've had some, uh, oh, it not only burned down, our mine burned, and souls were lost in that mine. Very tragedy at the Kennedy Mine. So I think 51... Wow, forty-one or fifty-one men were uh, trapped and lived a few days and then and then died. But you had the China Grave, which, as they built the walls, the Chinese that were out here years ago built the walls and would pass out from exhaustion and die. They would throw them in the wall to make them. So we have a lot of the mining days, those type of days, early structure of our county. We definitely have a you know a wild west as it was built. Those people died, and I think I definitely know that there's some spirits around here wow absolutely Very cool. and i think every business owner that has an old building has experienced it because the day i started renting down there i i didn't really get a huge feeling but i've brought people down there and they're like man i get a weird vibe from your place 
the first time they're there. After a while, you know, they feel okay, but they're always like, this is a creepy place. There, there's an atmosphere, right? That yeah, happens. you can feel it. Yeah. You can feel it. Wow, Trevor, thanks. Yeah, um, no problem. And, and what's the name of your studio? It's called Temple Studio and Production. And it's a spiritual place of its own. What do you, what, what do you, is it rock and roll? Is it? I record everything. I uh, have a certificate in audio engineering. So any artist out here, musician that's serious about their music, they contact me. Well, that was a great uh, conversation with Trevor there at uh, Stanley's Bar downstairs at the National Hotel. Um, did you see his group? He had a nice entourage over in the corner of the bar. Yeah, they had a, was it a birthday party or what was that? Was, I don't just, know, but I think there's a chance that maybe somebody spent the night with him that night. Sounds like one of them did, <laughs> or tried to. So the, um, the National Hotel, circa uh, 1849, is a haunted relic from the gold rush itself. It's also a spooky place with plenty of stories of shadows, footprints, footsteps, and other phenomena. The most famous story is of children playing all hours of the night when there are no children staying in the hotel. Doors slamming, bar equipment disappearing and returning, and the list goes on and on. We talk to bartenders and, and people upstairs. But here's a, a great snippet from the hotel front desk clerk about her story when she first started working there. The hotel, myself personally, in the last three weeks, I've experienced two experiences. And that was one here in the middle of the night. I was just dusting and cleaning. And there wasn't a full house. There was two people in house. They were up on the fourth story. And I heard these kids playing. And I'm going, I'll be damned. I better go and check on them because they're in the hallway and you can tell that our hallways are kind of unlevel. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the carpet is rolled, it's not quite stretched. So the first thing I thought of was, they're gonna fall. They're gonna fall. Because I can hear running and they've got some kind of little kink. So I like, it kind of clinks. So I went around the corner and I'm working with my manager and I hear these kids giggling, and I go around the corner, and there's nobody there. So I was like, them little stinkers. They got all the way down to the elevator before I got down there. So I went down in the elevator, and there's nobody there. So I came back up, started doing my cleaning, and I had asked my boss, you know, where are the kids staying? What floor are they staying on? And that's when my boss had told me, well, there's only two women in house tonight, and there's no children. And he just kind of laughed at me. And he goes, did you hear him too? And I just about cracked my pants. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> I'm going, no way. And it was really sweet because you could hear the softness of their footsteps. You can hear that they were little people, that they were yeah. children. You can hear their giggle. Um, and then another night I had experienced when you can hear women. We were sitting here. You can hear women talking, but you can hear them pass by you. So it wasn't just like you and I talking here. You can hear them and then hear them from a distance whispering to their legs. Oh, wow. And it gave me just, I just got goosebumps. Him. I just got goosebumps. Because you can literally hear that voice carry across the room. That freaked me out. But you got to learn to accept it. Now, my biggest incident was like the second day I was working here, I was in housekeeping, was not doing front desk. And I was down literally this far. I'm cleaning underneath this vanity like this with the toothbrush, mind you, okay? Getting the dust out from the cracks. And I'm like this, and my foot jerks like that so hard that I had a bruise like this on my foot for a few weeks. My this is almost my fourth week here. Um, my third and a half week, something like that. I dented the trash can. That's how hard I kicked it. You got pulled. Because I got like that. And it felt like a jerk. And I'm going, am I getting that old or I'm having spasms, <laughs> you know? The first thing I did was jump up and I hit that um, handle on the vanity of the sink. And the handle is what gave me a little noggin here. I had a little oh scab here that was there for like two weeks. It's a little bit of an indention, just a little chunk. Because I just bumped it and I was out of that room in no time. And... That was 308, and I don't want to go back into 308. So, room 308. 308, <laughs> that Hotel happened. Yeah. In Jackson, mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. yes. And then when I heard the children, I was right here in the hallway, and with me and my other coworker, Hannah, we heard the two women right here in this entryway. 
Well, in case you weren't clear, while she was cleaning the shower, something grabbed her ankle and pulled real hard. That would explain your wet hands, Mark. That No, that wouldn't explain my wet hands. That was because I'm the one that washes their hands after they go to the bathroom. But pretty cool, spooky stuff from the little town of Jackson and the National Hotel. But we'd been there way too long. It was dark, and we had a pretty big ride to Angel's Camp where we had rented a condo for the night. Though I still remember the stop, Keith, that you uh, had to have. What was that all about? I wanted to look at the stars that evening. Yes, you wanted to gaze at the stars, and we all did that. And then when we said, let's go, you said, no, a little while longer. (laughs) That is not true. (laughs) You know what, though? He did say, and I remember this, and my memory's not great, but... He did remind us to, re- to enjoy this night, and I did, and I don't give a shit what the rest of you say. <laughs> it was a worthwhile stop, and I'll never forget it. It was beautiful, but I did not see a single UFO. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, while we were at that stop, there's, there's some discrepancies, some arguments here, but our sweep rider and our second to the last rider may have had a little bit of a knock-up, a little bit of a collision, a little fender bender. Hmm. Um, A visor bender. It was a visor bender, Greg. What what do you uh, mean by that, Greg? Well, it seems that the visor of my helmet had come in contact with the second to the last rider's (laughs) vehicle. Uh, Allegedly. (laughs) I know that my visor was askew for the next 35 minutes. So, so um, Greg, uh, Greg, you had a vertical visor. I did. And you continued to ride it with your eyes on each side of it. <laughs> Sometimes riding sweep carries great responsibility. Driving's a serious business. And with great responsibility. That's right. Comes great, great consequence. That's right. <laughs> so someday we're going to get the real when story. The big dogs. You got to get out of the tall grass. That's right. So uh, Mike uh, left you to ride sweep on the way back. You got lost, but Lonnie and I came back and found you a few miles away. Got you back. Got a hamburger in you. Got you put to bed. And uh, live to tell the tale. That's my uh, my byline. It's kind of a quiet, cold morning the next morning. It it did, but it, <laughs> yes, it was. We but we had the night before and day before. I had a huge day of riding. We were exhausted. And it was a great sleep. Um, and then we were the next day headed to the Delta with its rich history and paranormal, paranormal activity. Um, we're going to have another podcast, it looks like, based on that. So before we get there, here's some original music from the weeknights. A Seattle man I forced you to listen to, and you can find their music everywhere. And they all wear paranormal things. Of course, everything we play by them is used by permission. This song is called Motion.
podcast and all others, including the music by Weeknights, is copyright by Chasing Ghosts on Scooters in Bars. You hear that?